was uh, was born. Um, we look at the journalism industry in Scotland and Northern England and really try and emphasise that um, the media industry shouldn't be so London, London centric. And uh, we get uh, people from the industry to give advice and store, share their stories for students and new journalists. Brilliant, thank you. And as someone who works for the Yorkshire Post, I'm very aware of Northern Natter. We, uh, <laughs> we love you guys and it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> where are we going next? Um, Satandrika, would you like to tell us a bit about your podcast? Muted, yeah. <laughs> um, so my background is I've been a journalist since like 2006, which is terrifying. Uh, my first job was at The Guardian when it wasn't digital first and all the internet was on the top floor. Um, so I, I'd help put the newspaper online. So I was way back in Farrington Road days. And then since then I worked at the Associated Press. So I worked for a news agency quite a few years on international breaking news. And then um, my last staff role was under Reach PLC. It was Trinity Mirror at the time. And I worked at Daily Mirror, but then across all the regionals, I was traveling everywhere. And it was there that I made my first podcast. So that was called Black Mirror Cracked. It was about the show Black Mirror. And that was back in December 2017 that came out. So it was when series four of Black Mirror, like the second one on Netflix, dropped. So we put the podcast out on the same day. And we did seven episodes. We had um, six previews of the episodes and interviewed Charlie Brooker and Annabelle Jones, who's the he makes it with him, he's a showrunner with him. So that hit 20,000 in its first week, which I'd say now, I don't know what numbers look like now for TV companion podcasts, obviously big companies are in, in the game and that kind of thing. But that kind of was like, oh, so yeah, when you do something for a news organization, I think Alison knows working for each PLC, like the numbers are really important. They wanna see that something's working. So we got to work on it for another six months. We got up to 150,000 downloads over those six months, over 30 episodes. So again, like I don't know if those numbers matter now. And I'm not saying that numbers matter if you're making like an indie podcast, but usually within a news organization, they want you to justify what your time was being spent on that stuff when I could have been training the entire company. And then, and I did pretty much. And then since I've left um, Reach PLC, I started Freelance Pod, which is about how the internet's changed creative jobs. So that started in November, 2018 had a bit of a break over um, lockdown. I wasn't really feeling it. And I think that is okay. And then I've started up again and I'm doing some more episodes. I've moved into comedy a little bit in the last year and there's sort of like comedian focused episodes coming up. So I'm also changing what the podcast is about. <laughs> Oh, what, a, what a varied, a varied um, background, but that's really interesting. Thank you so much um, for that. And um, Sadia, I think you uh, are on the final list, so tell us about your podcast. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us, um, especially if you're joining us on a Sunday morning. Um, so I'm a comedian and uh, that's my, my background, obviously, as a writer as well. Um, and No Country for Young Women came about. Um, BBC Sounds was launching in 2017. And so we started having some conversations and um, I pitched the idea to them, which was about to talk about race and, and talk about love as well from like the perspective of me and my co-host Monty, um, basically to try and capture our normal phone conversations, which I found quite hilarious. So it might be that she's outside a shop um, trying to buy batteries because her vibrators, her vibrators run out of batteries. So um, we had loads of fun chat and, and talked about issues that we didn't always feel were represented in um, entertainment or podcasting, um, but in an honest and down to earth way, not a kind of wokish type of way. So um, we got like loads of celebrities and we kind of got to interview other guests as well um, to talk about their experiences of belonging. Um, and, and yeah, so it's been really fun. Um, also so now writing my first book which is called Sex Bomb which is really exciting um yeah brilliant thank you so much and look to everyone that's uh in the session today just a reminder to pop your questions in the chat I've come armed with a load of questions um but hopefully we can hear from some of you guys as well as a reminder if you don't want to put them in the chat you can send them to me directly via DM and I can read them out about your name. I don't know why that would be a sensitive subject, but it might be, I don't know. I don't know what you might want to ask these guys. Um, so <laughs> feel free to DM it as well. Um, so I guess to start off and we'll stick in the same order that you introduced yourself in, just to keep it easy if we can. I, what I was, I'm interested to know about the kind of process that you went through to start your podcast. Cause I imagine a lot of people who are kind of here today would really love to start their own podcast, but don't really know 
where to begin? I think we kicked off with Alistair, didn't we? Yeah. Um, so as I kind of alluded to at the start, uh, me and Will pretty much winged it from day one, which I do not advise um, for a lot of people, as in we had a sort of general concept of how we wanted to structure the show and what we wanted the show to be. We had zero technical knowledge, zero idea of how to actually put a podcast out there, um, let alone any hosting experience of anything like this before. So it's very much been a, a learning process um, as we've gone. In terms of the practical side of it, first thing we did is essentially get some content together, um, which, which always helps as sort of a, a first port of call. Um, and again, getting the equipment right. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish that we knew that at the start because the first microphone that we both used was absolutely awful and not right for the job whatsoever. Um, so in terms of sort of recording what you've got, if you've got an idea, I always say think about the environment you're in. Um, before the pandemic, we recorded on the go. So we like to, to travel to meet our guests a lot of the times. Most of the time that was speaking in public places. So there's a lot of background noise you've got to contend with at the same time. So again, this has taken a year's worth of process to actually get there. But we ended up stumbling upon a setup that actually worked quite well for just putting it in a bag and off you go. Um, I always say for um, recording on the go, the most important thing you can get is a preamp or a, a sort of mixing desk, if you like. We use a preamp um, basically so you can have a bit more freedom and control over the, the exposure, things like that, that you've got to deal with um, when you're traveling on the go. So much more important, in my view, than spending, you know, 100 quid on a good microphone. I'd also say get a dynamic microphone rather than a condenser microphone if you're traveling on, on the go because they're far more robust and not as um, susceptible to feedback and things like that. It's why live musicians use dynamic microphones. Now that we're in the pandemic world, um, all of our recording is pretty much done from our bedrooms. The whole world has seen my bedroom at the moment. Um, and that's where you can bring in condenser microphones, um, which is what I'm using at the moment, uh, a Blue Yeti, which I think is pretty much the go-to for every single podcaster in their bedrooms. That's what I would recommend in terms of equipment. For that idea that you've got, I can't remember who told me this, which is really, really annoying because I say it every single time, the 10 word or less rule. If you can't explain your show, in less than or in 10 words or less, it's probably far too complicated to make a podcast out of it. Um, in terms of our own podcast, uh, athlete feature interviews, three words, simple. You've got to be able to tell someone, say, the imaginary bus stop scenario. You've got, you know, 10 seconds to tell someone about your podcast quickly. Um, you've got to sell them kind of instantly. So that's, that's what I'd say in terms of getting it set up um, and getting the right equipment and having an idea to roll with. Then it all comes down to the technical side of it, i.e. finding a podcast host. Um, there's loads of options out there. We use Audio Boom, which I can go into more detail later on if people want me to. Um, we started off on SoundCloud, another kind of error that we made early doors, which is fine as a host, but it's not geared to podcasters. Um, so it's far harder to get it picked up by other podcast channels like um, Spotify Connect, um, Stitcher, places like that. So I would always recommend, by all means, have SoundCloud if you want, but it's not, not supposed to be your main host. Um, and then my last bit of recommendation, really, along with social media, which I think goes without saying, always nice to have some social media platforms to share your work and get it seen. I would always advise getting a website too. It can act as a little bit of a home on the internet for you. If people like what you're doing and like your idea, then it's somewhere automatically where they can go and find more of your content, find out a bit about you as hosts, what you kind of stand for. Um, but as well as, in our case, interviews, it gets them to, to find other interviews and other stories that they might not have discovered um, without that, that website, particularly some historical ones. So I'd say those are my kind of top tips for getting going early doors and not making the first mistakes we did. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Katie, over to you. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just counting now a tagline there. I was like, is mine 10 words? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so where to start? Um, yeah, have, you know, it is about your idea. You know, it needs to be something that is like is going to fill a gap because there's loads of podcasts out here out there and, and you know especially over lockdown everyone was doing a podcast um or trying to anyway so I think it's really important to think about like where that gap is like can you fill 
is, you know, something that's missing. Are you that person to do it? Um, and if your idea isn't, then try to make it that idea. <laughs> um, so we, yeah, we started, we used Anchor. Um, uh, that's what we use to host our podcast. Um, and like Alistair, um, we didn't have much experience with making podcasts. I've had a little bit with um, BBC The Social and me and Katie both studied radio and had a bit of radio experience. Um, so that was quite, that was like really useful in terms of uh, sound producing and knowing what sounds good. Um, and recording and editing as well. You know, we are, both of us are capable editors and already had um, the software for it. Um, and yeah, I think that's, everything <laughs> um oh, isn't it when you've done like you know loads of episodes now you're like how did we actually start this really yeah. really <laughs> yeah, I, <know. laughs> I think I think it really just came with just like we were both a little bit frustrated you know seeing especially you know, we sign up for a lot of um like job new newsletters and things and I was actively looking for um a journalist job and they were just they're all in London which is fine if you live in London or are happy to relocate but I'm quite happy in Scotland right now um you know I've grown up here so yeah I, I just want I just wanted to sort of prove that there well we both wanted to prove that there was enough talent um and you know people don't have to move down south you know to get uh, to get that job um which um I feel like I can prove because I'm starting at Reach PLC on Monday with Glasgow Live so you know, I can still do it without moving, without, you know, I can do it from Sterling, <laughs> you know. Um, Congratulations, lots of shout out for Reach today. Go on, I know, on Reach. you guys were mentioning it, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm part of that too now. <laughs> Brilliant, um, thank you. Yeah, know. that's, I think that's about it. Obviously, like, if anyone, if I've missed something and anyone has any questions, or okay, Katie, you can, like, send me a message or something, <laughs> keep me right. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so, Danica, what what would your tips be for starting out? I know that you're, you know, a bit further down your podcasting career now, but I'm sure you still remember how kind of terrifying it was when you first started. Yeah, starting with podcasts at Reach PLC. I'd say Reach is doing a really good job on podcasts. And the person I made my podcast Black Mirror Crack with was Dan Jackson, who I imagine you guys probably know Reach PLC. He's probably working on all the podcasts now. So he sort of said, I'll do the tech side if you've got the journalism side down because I've been interviewing people for years and so I've been recording them on my phone so that's what I really started with and I still say now that as a freelance I don't have tons of money my studio is my wardrobe back there <laughs> and um, I use my phone my laptop and maybe like um, a double lavalier microphone so that's one that clips to you and clips to someone else and goes into your phone so you can get them for 20 pounds and under usually on the internet and um, I'm, a, I'm like a um, I'm a monthly sort of panellist on a podcast called The Week Unwrapped, and that's how they do it. Zoom, phone, send it to the producer. So say to begin with, um, it's quite good to not know what you're doing and just to dive in. I think you have to take risks, really. I think careers in journalism are going to look like that. If you want to stand out and brand yourself as someone who has done certain things and you have to break out of the doing shifts, doing the same work as everyone else. Right, I've done my eight stories. I'm done. Unfortunately, journalism is more than that if you want to stand out and make a name for yourself. So like diving in and don't worry, like how wrong can you go with a podcast? Yeah, if it's silent, you've got a problem, but you can't go that wrong. You're giving people content for free. Usually they're really grateful for it. So I'd say that you're going to make mistakes and they're going to be quite painful to begin with. I remember that I was spending two weeks at the Birmingham Post because they were becoming the Birmingham Live. So that's January 2018. And they showed me like a meeting room and said, oh, you can record your podcast here. Seem to have lost there. Tell you what, shall we go on? Oh, 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 yeah, so oh my God, this is... <laughs> Don't worry, we'll come back to you. Shall we move on? <laughs> Sadie, do you want to um, 
jump in and we'll try and get we'll try and get back <laughs> yeah, sure so basically i was quite surprised so once we um had the discussions with the bbc i thought let's get in the studio let's get this done and it took six months of preparation before we actually even recorded a demo um so i and i look back and i am really grateful for that because actually um it, there's a temptation to just dive right in and I've heard a lot of like friends etc who who start the first episode and lose momentum after maybe one or two so it needs to kind of build and um, six months is obviously a very long time and you you probably these days might be able to be a, a little bit more streamlined but I would say at least six weeks to, to two months maybe um, and just shoot the hay you really really have to know know it inside out as Alistair said it, it should be easy to explain because podcast listeners have very short short attention span so you, you the statistics show that they um, are interested in the first like 15 seconds and if you haven't got them in something as brutal as that time um, approximately then you've probably lost them and they will just move on um, and my other advice would be to make sure it's the topic and theme that you love because it's something you're going to talk about weekly or, or very regularly and so if it doesn't interest you, it's not going to interest anybody else. Um, obviously, there are loads of podcasts out there. And so, as Katie said, you want to stand out. So even if it is something that is similar to something else that's being done, don't be discouraged because your stance on it will be different um, and try and think about how you can be different. That's really crucial. Um, that will be fun. And um, also, just when you're interviewing people, because obviously it's a skill, I will admit that I got a lot better after the first episode and series there's a steep learning curve so you won't just it's fine to to be a beginner and then like you'll learn so much across the board not just journalism but other skills and, and it can help you upskill and broaden your skills and your networks are key as well um the other thing I would say just my last point would be always ask um your if you are interviewing like a good get out if you're stuck is to ask the question why um so because everybody wants to know that and that will always give you some good insight into something so if you are stuck or if if you feel a little not out of your depth but if you feel like you you just um need to probe further just you can never go, go wrong with that question some really great tips thank you and you're so right about the you know kind of accepting that you're not going to be perfect when you first start out i know i've listened back to some of the old episodes of my podcast recently because i'm leaving i'm leaving my job so i'm leaving the podcast behind I've got oh. <laughs> so i've listened back to it and i'm, I'm thinking what was I thinking? <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It's like it's good to try, it and and we wouldn't be where we are now if we didn't take those first steps. So so please, like, don't be overcritical. And and also, sorry, I'm gonna have to say this as a comedian, but listen back to it. Um, I know that sometimes we hate our voices. Um, I hate mine. I hate everything. To be honest with you, but um, you will really hear things afterwards that will make you a better editor, or that will make you um kind of you know those things that you say that you shouldn't say all the time, like my one was oh my god oh my god I would always say stuff like that and you don't know that because that's your little um word thing basically but it will help you tighten it up and and come across a bit more slick um the other thing I wanted to say thank you for prompting me is that obviously you have the choice of going to a producer or a production company and getting them to do it or you can do it everything yourself and so think think wisely about that I think um, it's not that you don't have the skills to do everything yourself but if you're presenting and, and researching and, and interviewing that's a lot of energy and sometimes having somebody uh, to help you begin even if they're producing just the first series maybe whilst you build your confidence um, then that gives you some space to kind of like you know do do your bit in terms of the presenting so think about that wisely I, I know it's not easy to um, you know hire somebody or it might be might not be uh, cheap but maybe you can barter as students and, and help them in other ways absolutely my my tick word is absolutely i did it just then it's absolutely i listen back to <laughs> everything i reply to people is mm, absolutely and i'm like i hate you saying that now what am i doing <laughs> yeah I, I agree with that every time we listen back and it's like oh that's so interesting <laughs> I, I just want to say like I do make a game like take a shot every time me and Katie say oh that's so interesting <laughs> and I'm sure also, yeah Sorry. but also just to say um like you know because uh, me and Katie Baggett you know we hadn't really made podcasts before and we had about a two-month planning section um, before we actually launched and that you know that was so good to really like streamline and know exactly what we were doing the format we wanted to get guests um like practice runs as well and also it, even though you know 
we're still learning as we're going along. We're still making mistakes and you still look back and think, oh, I could do better there. But I found even if you kind of mess up or it's not too slick during the interview, like when you're recording, it's okay to acknowledge that to your guests. You know, they know, well, I'm assuming our guests know that we're not 100%, you know, professional. Um, in a way, we kind of are, but not always. <laughs> but it's okay to like acknowledge that and say, oh, we're still learning. And I think it gives that sort of understanding. And I think they respect you for that. Or that's why I feel anyway. And, you know, we've had so many guests on who've actually offered advice after which we, I really appreciate because they're the ones who've been in this industry longer than we have. And, you know, like I said, we get guests on to give advice. So it's good that we actually get advice on the way too. So I would say that if you are starting and you are a newbie as well, don't worry, like don't panic and just, just go with it. And, you know, you'll get there, you'll learn on the way. And I think and it's plays, really It plays into the podcasting as a medium, which is more conversational, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's like, there was a bit, um, which I always laugh at where my microphone fell in one of the episodes and you can hear it and you could see on the wave thing, the absolute spike because my microphone toppled over and uh, we kept it in because I thought, you know what, I think it's just so, <laughs> it, it, it just happens. We are recording from our bedrooms. Um, I was balancing it on pillows, so it happens. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And um, so Tendrick, should we come back to you? If you got cut off from Zoom, it's a, it's a you know perennial problem of the COVID like, era, isn't it? Mistakes, what was that? Have good internet connection. Actually, no, when you're recording, always be on flight mode. Um, yeah, like I think everyone has made really good points. I don't think you can add too much more on this first question, but it, there is a learning curve. You, you'll learn over time. You'll walk into a room and you'll see that it's good for recording or not, you'll be able to tell. It's not about the microphone, it's about what you're learning at the time so like my first episodes were terrible I was lucky that I was working with someone who knew more about tech than I did and I learned how to edit from him so where you can as students like see who's got other skills to you who's up for collaborating because you never know you could be doing this again 10 years down the line to so start now I'd say look for collaboration first and I think um Sarge and Katie mentioned planning so definitely plan absolutely I think we probably did like a month of planning and we thought very carefully about distribution so when does when does the show come out on Netflix let's make sure our podcast is there at the same time so the moment people finish one episode of Black Mirror because it's not a series you don't necessarily watch episode after episode but the moment they finish one I had this feeling of a Black Mirror viewer watching stuff on their laptop and then be like oh I need to talk about that like, oh what like that and they go and search your podcast and they found ours so thinking about the distribution is part of the planning but then don't let that planning go on so long because you're afraid and you're afraid of what people think most of what people think is either oh my god wow they made a podcast or if they think something negative is pretty because they're a bit envious so plan but don't let it become an excuse to not start excellent advice excellent advice so guys i do want to remind you to get your questions in on the chat or to send me a couple via um dm i'm going to reverse our order now just to shake things up a bit it's very exciting for a sunday morning i know i don't know how we'll possibly cope um but i guess one of the kind of tropes that you often hear don't you say uh, oh so and so started a podcast and in lockdown it was like oh everyone's starting a podcast do you think there are too many podcasts for new people to break in and let's start with sadia no, 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 no. I think um, I think it should be something that, you know, you believe in. Um, and I think it's a really cheap way of trialing ideas. So it can be anything, um, which is what's really exciting about podcasting. So, um, for example, to, to do a, a pilot of a sitcom, it can cost thousands. And, you know, you need to get a lot of people on board. But um, you know it's a way if you if you're able to do that in a podcast and then show that as a, and submit that to for example somebody who you're trying to get a commission by um that's that's what it shows a lot of ingenuity and so it's a very versatile um platform or, or medium i i think i think you know there are obviously ones that are doing what i would say um i don't mean to be controversial but there's a lot of ones that are celebrity um podcasts these days or you know recently um i think podcasting started off as quite um uh, a ground level kind of sport and then and then uh, celebrities realized oh this is doing really well and they were at home as well during lockdown so um 
you know, there's, there's room for everybody, but you do want to stand out and be different. So um, just make it make it authentic and make it something that you're really passionate about and, and you feel that you will give it a unique spin because, um, you know, what the way you approach it will be different as the way somebody else would approach it. So try and be different, but it's a great way to learn. And, and, ha and sometimes as a student, you may not know which what you want to do. And so the, the kind of benefits of podcasting is it will give you a lot of exposure and, and kind of Put you right in there and then it might help you um in terms of deciding what your what your passion is and, wh and where to go so it's, it's worth doing i think i i mean i never look back with any regrets i think um i think the thing was you know a few years ago when, when podcasting was really peaking was people were like oh i'll get around to it so you know maybe maybe we've just had a little bit of a, uh, a spike from from the people who always meant to do one and didn't do it but you'll learn so much from it Brilliant. And I think we're going in reverse. So let's go back to um, Tantrica. What do you reckon? Is it a too crowded field? No, so I think of podcasts as like non-fiction books. So like, have we, has the publishing industry stopped? No, absolutely hasn't. And what I've noticed is that when we went into lockdown, so I'm a freelancer, and loads of freelancers I know got book deals. And if you kind of looked at the books, they're fairly similar. So it's looking like each publishing house wanted their version of the, right, you're a freelance, this is stuff you need to know. Or, you know, kind of mental health around freelancing because it is really lonely. It can be really tough to kind of make sure you're actually living as well as working because living and working are happening in the same place. And so if publishing does that and it's doing it for money, I don't see where podcasting can't do that. And we're all doing it for free. So I find that that argument is coming from people probably because there isn't a very good discovery engine for podcasts. So there's no one way we can find podcasts. Like you can Google and we think about um, SEO, search engine optimization, when you name your podcast, a so Black Mirror Cracked, a good SEO, it was easy to find. Freelance pod, Maybe it's quite easy to find, but it's not necessarily just about freelancing. So it's a little bit different. It's not as great as I in that sense. Um, so yeah, so think about where that kind of doom and gloom stuff is coming from. And it's usually for people going, oh, I need to get through all the podcasts that exist. No, you don't. There are like 2 million on Apple Podcasts. Now. There always, there's always another million every time I look. But you don't have to listen to all of them. Like you will never listen to every song. You'll never read every book and you're going to be okay. What you want to do is think about who your audience might be. So Black Mirror is really obvious. There is a huge fandom for Black Mirror and for Charlie Brooker. And we want to target them. And that wasn't that hard to do. So if you're doing kind of companion podcasts, that can work really well. Just think about like kind of almost market marketing really it's like a focus group thing who am i targeting with freelance pod I, I was almost doing it more for myself so i was like i've gone freelance i want to figure out how to do this and also be nice to chat to people and yet you, you get told this thing a lot in journalism right which is go and take people for coffee and ask them stuff but i would say with freelancing like people's time is their money and so it isn't quite the right thing to be asking things for people i think without trying to offer something from in kind and i say that as people with similar loves similar levels of years of experience. Obviously, if you're, you know, three years into journalism, you're talking to someone with 20 years experience. If they're in a sort of mentoring scheme, they want to mentor you, that's different. But I thought, you know, I can't just ask people for their time, what can I offer them? And so I thought if I offer them a podcast episode then they can use that as a bit of a show reel, maybe they want to get into podcasting. I find lots of freelancers do. they are like, oh, how does this work? What's going on? And so I thought, great, that's the way to do it. And it's like having a nice chat with people, which was really good for me sort of mentally, because otherwise you could not speak to someone for ages apart from your flatmate. Um, so yeah, so I think, think about really what you want from it. Don't worry about the people saying there are too many. Like there are too many of every kind of art every kind of medium you don't need to read or listen to all of them but who's the audience you want and what do you give to them what are they missing and and think about it that way think about it in positive terms also if yourself what is it doing for you so black mirror cracked in a sense we were sort of guinea pigs for each plc and now look what's happening in the podcast obviously it's a major part of their business and at the time there were very few podcasts and we thought well we're going to try a tv companion one because before that it was kind of mirror politics and mirror sports like those kind of verticals sections of the newspaper and we went very niche and at first our bosses were like are you sure there are enough people who love this that much and I was like I think so because it's got it's on Netflix it's global it's pretty big and so we were proof right I say freelance pod it's more for me to build my profile and to meet people um to build a show reel to get more presenting stuff more speaking gigs so it's done that for me it hasn't ever brought in a penny in terms of sponsorship advertising but I didn't try to do that I didn't want to go down that road with it but it's done the other things for me in that way so think about more what it does for you but also what you give to an audience and don't worry about the people who are saying 
no, 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 you can't do it. Again, they're probably frustrated creatives or people who don't understand the game at all and they're not helpful to you. Brilliant, thank you. Now look, what I'm actually going to do is move on to some of the questions in the chat because I'm just aware we've only got 12 minutes left and I want to ask as many questions from um, our members as we can. And I think probably Katie and Anderson are probably going to say similar stuff about doing it anyway. Yeah, there we go. So Lauren has asked, do you have any tips for recording a podcast with an interviewee who may not have a mic remotely in a way that still has good sound quality? And I remember Trimdika, last year on the panel, you saying you recorded in a cupboard. I record um, between two clothes horses with uh, various blankets draped over the top. But this is more about, um, I don't know if this is more about kind of the actual software that you use or how you set up. I mean, um, Katie, should we go to you first? Yeah, so we just use um, Zoom to record. That way you can have see them on video and it can record the audio separately. Um, the downside is that Zoom can glitch sometimes, so it's good to have all your guests to record. Um, and we also get them to record on their phone. So have a voice note, like not voice note, but um, voice recorder on the phone and put it next to them. So at least we have something in case Zoom crashes. Um, if they don't actually have like like uh, this sort of mic, um, headphone mics work fine. You know, um, into, you know, if you are just starting, you don't need like the best equipment. And I do think it's a myth that you don't need to fork out like hundreds and hundreds of pounds for equipment. Um, you know, like I said, um, microphone, a headphone mics can work. Um, and I prefer that than just using computer audio because computer audio is really tinny. Um, and, but then just be aware of it, like hitting clothes or something like that. We had someone wearing bracelets we didn't realize and then we listened to it back and you could hear like a jingling in the background and I was like, oh. um, but these things happen, you just deal with it. Um, so that's what I would say, um, but I don't know, um, yeah, someone else might have better. <laughs> have uh, better any, software. any of our panelists, feel free to jump in if you've got any, uh, any tips on this one. Um, it's probably not the right answer. I think Katie answered it really well, but my one would be maybe don't, um, just because sound is so crucial with podcasting um, and anything really like, you know, if, if people can't hear you. Um, so just just uh, feel if it's your first time, then then maybe test it and then see if it's if it sounds worth it just because you know I don't have access to a sound mixer who can try and um, zhuzh it up for me so just I would tread cautionally when it comes to with sound. Yeah to chuck in a quick 30 second uh, addition to that our third ever episode um, our interviewee we did it in the car uh, on her phone and because it was episode three I was not confident enough to say this is not good <laughs> let's let's stop so also having the confidence to acknowledge and, and politely tell whoever it is you're interviewing that, you know, the sound quality is not up to scratch. What can we do to, to try and sort that? Um, and by all means, you can have that discussion and that chat with them. But, but by and large, I, I agree with the Zoom thing. It's been a massive lifesaver mm -hmm. uh, over the last year and a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that you guys have posted some stuff in the chat as well for people yeah. to have a chat. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, right, what else? Well, I have other questions have we got here? So Alyssa has asked, the panelists have mentioned interviewing, but she was wondering if they, if you had any more tips for first time interviewers, how do you know which guests to invite, how to make them comfortable when they're on the show and that kind of thing. Shall we start with you, Alistair? I'll mute myself. Um, yeah, I suppose considering our show is a feature interview show, um, it doesn't really happen without guests. So in terms of getting started, um, and trying to find that first guest you'll once you manage to get that first person you, you can start the ball rolling because then you've got stuff to showcase to other people you're going to and approaching um, to say look this is what we've done in the past this is the kind of conversations we've been doing do you want to be a part of it as well in terms of getting that first person um, literally anything is on the table um, think outside the box our first ever guest for our podcast was James Davis, who's um, an Olympic fencer, once world number one, purely because I used to fence, so I know him. So I just dropped into his DMs and said, do you want to do, do this? Our second guest was um, Ollie Robinson, who's a cricketer for Kent, who happened to be Will's next door neighbour. And that's how we got that interview. So once we built up those first two, um, it, it, it helps um, so much just getting that ball rolling. In, in terms of actually doing the interviewing, 
And I kind of get asked this as well by the reporters that I manage for the website. It obviously depends who you're talking to. So kind of know your guest, do your research, make sure you know plenty about them and that you can show you're interested. But as Sadia mentioned, it's a conversational medium. Have a conversation with them and that's all it really needs to be. It doesn't have to be a grilling. It doesn't have to be anything like that. So just listen and be engaged in the conversation very often your next question will come in what they've just said in their answer um, and that will take you on to wherever that conversation may go and it'll probably take you on to somewhere that you didn't expect the conversation to go but think back to the episode we put out today with emily borthwick and any athletics fans might know her name from what she did at the european indoors in march where it was her gb debut and she ended up jumping a pb getting to the final finishing eighth in europe no one expected that talked to her and we thought it was going to be about you know the experience but actually it turned into a mental health conversation because it was all about her her mindset and how she'd felt she'd been holding herself back for four years and all of a sudden like she, something just clicked in her brain type thing to actually be like no I am good enough I, I am going to be good enough to jump over that bar so I'd always say just try and be as relaxed as possible and just treat it as a conversation with anyone else and if you are interested if you're doing something that you're passionate about that will will come naturally so by all means do your planning do your research but i'd always say don't again don't panic which seems to be a common theme of this particular panel um and just enjoy it and if you enjoy it then then the the smoothness if you like of the conversation will filter through on that podcast just if I could add, um, I think that's such a great point. Um, we were told um, to also watch other interviews. So, you know, like Larry King, um, he's amazing. And obviously I'm never going to be Larry King, but um, just why do I enjoy, you know, what did I enjoy about it? And it was his versatility. So exactly what Alistair said, you may start, you may be well-researched and structured and you may want to go A to B. They take you somewhere else. And it's about actively listening and then going where the conversation flows. Absolutely. Absolutely. Katie, anything you'd like to add on getting interviewees? Yeah, so I would say, um, Alistair, you said like think outside the box. So for us, it was really important to try and get as many different guests and to have that um, like diversity, you know, like I said, like not just about um, race or religion, but geographical diversity as well, which is so important. I mean, it's in our name, Northern Natter, but also you know, when we interview people from Scotland, not just Glasgow or Edinburgh, you've got, you know, because Glasgow is different from Edinburgh and Edinburgh is different from Aberdeen. Aberdeen is different from Elgin, <laughs> you know, so it's important to have all these experiences and these different voices too. It's so good. Like I love editing Northern Natter because we have just so many rich accents in and I'm just like listening. I'm like, oh, it just sounds so good. <laughs> um, and also like, I suppose like the journalism community or like the young journalism community can feel quite small, um, especially on Twitter. So I think we are quite good at, come, at getting out of that with our guests. You know, the guests that we have on aren't people that are on other young journalist podcasts. And that's something I'm really proud of because we're giving other people who might not be part of that sort of circle, that sort of bubble um, and coming on and giving them a platform to speak and, um, share their stories, share their work. And yeah, it, I think I think that's an important bit of advice I would give people, you know, go further with your guests, you know, try and get as many people as you can involved and because then they'll tell like their friends and like their followers will listen and, you know, yeah, that sort of, that sort of thing. <laughs> One thing I forgot to say, sorry. sorry. Um, but wholeheartedly back that as well. The more people you get on, then the more the word, word spreads and so on. Um, also, don't be afraid of what the answer might be. You'll be surprised who says yes. Um, there's so many people you might think, you know, oh, they're, they're so good. They're well beyond my reach. But one brave email, one punt, and then you can get a yes. And then again, the ball is rolling. So don't. the worst you're going to get is no or a non-response. So if, if you really want to talk to someone, by all means, go for it. Another just a small thing to add as well is if people have something to plug, they're most they're more likely as well. So if somebody has a book coming out and you see them doing something um, or an album coming out, whatever it is, um, definitely like uh, like Alistair said, just like try your try and, and then, you know, you may well be surprised. Yeah, brilliant. And Sandra, I'm just going to come to you last because part of Alyssa's question was how 
do you make interviewees comfortable? And I think that's something that we maybe haven't touched on on this question yet. Is there a way that you've got to, you know, put people at ease so that they don't, you know, they, they feel like they're relaxed and I imagine give their best answers? Yeah, so it kind of starts from even before you said the email. So look at your social media, look at how you're presenting yourself to the world. Because the first thing someone who doesn't know you will do, or their PA will do, is go and look at you, look your name up and, and see like how you talk about people in the media. So say you're going to try and get famous people who um, have talked about mental health before onto your podcast. That's a really sensitive area. Um, they probably want to do it because talking on a podcast is more enjoyable than speaking in a press junket you get more time you get to tell stories but if they look on your social media and they kind of think like oh this is a person for me or i'm not seeing them tweeting stuff about, social, about mental health you know it's that kind of thing so make sure you are positioning yourself as someone who's interested in this area who is involved in this area who cares about the stuff if you've got any examples of you interviewing anyone at all try and get them on your website or on your social media and then um and then yeah, from there, you will start to have ground rules after a certain amount of time because you will make mistakes, as I mentioned. You will learn the one that if anyone's got anything on their wrists, they'll make sounds on the table. So you start having ground rules. And I'll say, even if you're getting the queen in, have some ground rules because they want to know as well, like, what's the deal? Yeah, how long will it take? All these things. So just have some ground rules. Obviously, they can be flexible. If, if it's 45 minute interviews and you've got the queen, but she can only do 30 minutes, she gets 30 minutes, that's fine. So having some ground rules just lets them feel like, oh, this is a professional person. They know what they're doing because I don't understand audio and I'm flailing, but they are going to get me through this. So that's fine. And I think beyond that, just speak to them like a human, just, you know, no one's above each other, even if you've got like your dream person in, just chat to them, get them a glass of water, make sure they're comfortable. And what I would do is, and this, this also happens to people, you know, don't start with the like, oh, I'm going to do the podcast intro in front of you. We've got the queen here. She's amazing. She's the best monarch ever. She's great. Because that makes them go, oh, I'm in an interview. Oh God. So just like keep that chat going. And what I would do is those sorts of intro things, leave them to the end once they're warmed up. So have that great 45 minute chat or however long you have. And then at the end, I say to them, oh, can I? Can you just say like your name and your job title? Because freelancers often have complicated job titles. I mean, this and that, the other. And when they do it at the end, I found it flows much better and they're much more relaxed. It's like, cool, this is the admin stuff. And then we're done. And that was great. Whereas at the start, they're like, oh, oh, she's gone professional on me. I thought we were friends or, oh, who's this person? She's very different to the person on the emails. So I'd leave that kind of like intro, do the intro and outro when they're gone. You don't need them to be in the room for that. I find it very uncomfortable when they're like, this person won five Oscars, they're amazing. They're kind of going, oh, I have to be five Oscar person now. You want them to just feel like a friend who's popped by for a chat. And so the more you treat them like that, then the more they're going to be like that and you'll have a better podcast because that's what the lister wants. They want to feel like, oh, this is really intimate. I wouldn't ever get the story from this incredible person otherwise. And again, they don't have to be famous people. But I would just say the more you can treat them as a friend you're having a chat with over a cup of tea, um, the more they will respond in that way. And that makes for a better podcast. And I would also add, um, you know, just in terms of making them comfortable, like a joke never goes amiss because I've been a guest on podcasts and whenever they make me laugh, that just like breaks the seal. And then all of a sudden you do feel that connection like you've been like you've known each other for years and then you can kind of get get a lot more from them. Another 20 seconds just to add on top of that, sorry. Um, it, it, again, this is time, time uh, or relative to how much time you've got with them. But one thing I do is before I actually start the interview, I just spend 15 minutes before it just chatting, talk about their day, how things are, and you will gauge a how they are with you first off. But it will just warm them up and and get them to to realise that you're just about to have another conversation. Um, so yeah, it's 15 minutes without any pressure on them. We can just find out a little bit more about their day. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that as well. That's what we do. Yeah. And it works a treat. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much. We could have spoken for ages more, I'm sure, but we are out of time. Um, I don't know if you guys are happy to be contacted by our members afterwards. If you are, you know, I'm sure you can find these guys on Twitter and that kind of thing. And they'll probably be more than happy for you to drop them a message and ask them for any tips. I've just volunteered you now. Sorry, all of you, but um, I'm sure you can ignore them if you didn't want that. Um, so Thank you so much. Just to let you guys know about what sessions we have coming up next, let's have a look. In room one, we've got um, an in conversation with Hugh Edwards, which is going to be really, really interesting. And then in room two, we've got the basics of investigative journalism, which is also going 
it's pretty fascinating. So do get yourselves along to some of those. I can see the panelists are dropping their um, Twitters and TikToks and stuff in the chat. So that's really, you can, you can get those now. And yeah, thank you so much for coming guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.